Hi, good morning, everyone. I must admit that I was surprised about the answer from the audience. Are you going to ask again after our talk? We'll, uh, we'll I'm answer. curious now. We'll have another one. Lovely. Yep. So yeah, I'll do my best to try to explain you and, and convince you uh, that uh, we from the radiology department can also uh, give you some, some tools in order to better understand what's going on in a patient when, uh, you, treat, when you treat them. So, Let's start. I have no disclosures. So uh, in order to start uh, from, the, from the beginning, uh, let's see what's the, uh, by far the most uh, used um, uh, response criteria in clinical trials. And as you all know, it's uh, RECIS and the last version, which is the 1.1. Uh, that's very easy to apply. We just have to choose up to five target lesions and measure them at baseline and along treatment. So what we assess here is uh, macroscopic changes in size of the, of the tumors. This is based on, on robust uh, data um, in more than uh, 6,000 patients, and it was validated also in prospective uh, trials. Uh, however, you must take into account that this criteria, criteria was published in 2009, so almost 10 years ago, and it was based on responses to chemotherapy. We are in a completely different scenario nowadays in which uh, most of our trials are testing uh, targeted therapies, immunotherapies. So let's see which are the challenges of, of this criteria. And I would like to show you uh, three different scenarios or, or uh, settings in which uh, resist a challenge um, to uh, detect or pick up response. One is for anti-angiogenic uh, treatments, right? So uh, this gentleman had uh, colorectal cancer and he was treated with uh, regorafenib, a kinase inhibitor with anti-angiogenic effect. Uh, I can tell you that this patient responded to treatment. He was benefiting from um, regorafenib. However, if you see the, uh, do we have, maybe not, anyway. Um, so if you see the scan, uh, the CT scan after a few weeks of, of treatment, uh, the, thank you. Is it the pointer? Yeah. So the uh, tumor size of the pelvic mass and the liver metastasis uh, didn't change from baseline, although I think that it's obvious for all of you that the enhancement did change. So for resist, this patient uh, will have been considered as a stable uh, disease. However, we knew that uh, he was benefiting. Another scenario is immunotherapy. And this is a situation that is also well known by, by all of you. So this is a lady, in this case, with uh, cervix cancer, but we can apply it to different uh, tumor types as well. So with, uh, she had retroperitoneal uh, lymphadenopathy. And after 12 weeks of treatment, those lymph nodes increase in size. The patient was uh, absolutely fine, clinically well, so she continued treatment, and after 24 weeks of treatment, uh, she had a shrinkage of the retroperitoneal disease. So this, this is something, a situation that is well known, and it's called uh, pseudoprogression, and also it's a challenge for, for resist, and also even for the uh, last version of, of the uh, immune resist, uh, which also assess only changes in tumor size. And another situation is a bone metastasis. Uh, so this is a, a patient with a colorectal cancer in which the uh, bone scan and the uh, CT didn't change any lesion at baseline. And after 12 weeks of, of treatment, a new uh, focus of sclerosis appeared in one of the vertebras. So the question here is, uh, was it a, a MET that was present at baseline and we couldn't see by a standard um, imaging, and it was responding with new sclerosis, or if it's, uh, in fairness, a new uh, lesion and the patient is progressing? So by resist, it's impossible to, to, to say, uh, because these lesions are considered as non-measurable, uh, so we have no clue what's, what was going on in this case. And also another typical situation, and this is real life, these are real patients, are patients with widespread uh, sclerotic disease, in which I can tell you that bone scan and CT won't change along treatment, even if they are uh, responding or not. So the question here is, uh, is that all that we can offer you? Uh, so the, the answer is easy, it's no, that's why we are here today. So I will explain you how MRI and particularly how functional MRI sequences uh, can help us to uh, assess, to better uh, assess these kind of patients and situations. 
So you'll know that we have uh, anatomical MRI sequences that give us beautiful images about the tumor and about the uh, structures ar around them. We can uh, give you information about the tumor and even if it's infiltrating a little uh, small vessel or, or a nerve. Uh, but this is macroscopic information. We have also functional MRI sequences that are going to give us information about the histology, the, uh, the cellularity, the vasculature, and even the uh, molecules within a tissue. So uh, we can perform perfusion MRI, which will give us information about the vessels, diffusion-weighted MRI, which will give us information about tumor cellularity, and spectroscopy MRI, which give, uh, will give us information about the concentration of different molecules within the, within the tumor. So what can we study? As you know, uh, the vessels in the tissue are completely different to the vessels that uh, a tumor develops. In a tumor, we will have uh, dilated, tortuous, and, and leaking uh, vessels. And all these features can be studied with, with MRI. Those changes in, in the vessels was um, previously detected, obviously, and that's why uh, CHOI criteria um, was published a few years ago as well, in which they tried to uh, pick up those changes. So, um, sorry. So CHOI criteria includes uh, changes in tumor size, but also changes in uh, density on CT as response to treatment. But we can give you much more information with uh, uh, perfusion, perfusion MRI. Uh, we give a volus of, of uh, contrast to the patient, and these uh, contrasts will enter into the tumor, and then we will have a washout. So we can study the curves, how the, the contrast uh, comes into the tumor and gets out. We can study also uh, leaking of the contrast with catrans. We can give you volume uh, of the extravascular space, uh, contrast reflux, and enhancement. And the important thing here is that we can quantify all these parameters, so we can give you numbers. So this is the case I showed you uh, before. And you can see, again, the pointer, anyway, uh, that after uh, only 15 uh, days after starting treatment, we could quantify and detect a marked drop in the catrans, okay? And also, in that group of patients, the uh, measurements of different parameters of the uh, vasculature differentiate patients with completely different outcome, uh, so complete, uh, different survival and different uh, PFS. Okay, so as usual, we are, are going to have some issues with the video. Um, the next technique I, I wanted to mention today is uh, diffusion-weighted uh, imaging, and um, this is my favorite one. Depending on how we acquire the images, it's true that we can give you information about the vessels, but usually uh, we acquire the images in a way that mostly we um, study the tumor cellularity. So diffusion can be also quantified. We can give you information about the intensity on diffusion and a parameter called the ADC, the apparent diffusion coefficient. Okay, so if we have a tumor that is very cellular, what we will have are um, images that will be very bright on diffusion and will have uh, low ADC values. Okay, in the ADC map, these are represented usually as dark uh, lesions. If we treat the patient and he benefits from treatment and we cause some necrosis in the tumor, obviously the tumor uh, cellularity will drop. And therefore, we will have some uh, drop in the intensity of diffusion and also an increase of the ADC values. So again, we can uh, quantify this and we can follow up the patients. We have uh, shown before. Mm -hmm. Can we uh, go to the next slide? Someone? Previous one? Okay. So, uh, we have nowadays uh, tools that allow us to delineate, to draw all the areas of interest, not only in a, in a small um, area of the, of the body, but the whole, the entire body. Okay, so these are the um, areas of signal abnormality uh, in the bone. 
in the entire body. Uh, and we, uh, in previous studies, we have demonstrated in this case uh, that uh, diffusion-weighted imaging and ADC correlates with tumor cellularity in the bone, but it has been also uh, uh, correlated in other tumor types and in the, in the liver um, and so on. So I, I don't think you're going to see the videos, unfortunately. But I think that it's uh, obvious you don't need uh, to be a, a radiologist to detect that there was a marked drop in the areas of signal abnormality at baseline from the scan after 12 weeks of treatment. And again, we can quantify this volume of disease and also the increase of the ADC values. And this has been applied also in different settings. For example, in the setting of the evaluation of complete response to neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy in advanced uh, colorectal cancer. These are the results from three different readers, from the three different uh, radiologists. And if we assess only anatomical uh, uh, sequences, uh, T2 MRI, uh, you can see that the performance of MRI for detecting complete response is moderate, let's say. But if we include uh, functional MRI techniques such as diffusion-weighted imaging, the uh, uh, accuracy uh, increases quite a lot. And these are two examples. This is. Uh, you can see the tumor in here, and this is another patient with a tumor in this area. After uh, chemoradiotherapy, uh, we can detect a dark area in here and a dark area in here. And as you can understand, this is very complicated to, to, um, to define or to say if uh, this is just for fibrosis or if there are uh, um, remanent tumor there. But if we go to the diffusion weighted imaging, you can see a bright dot here, which is quite clear to everyone. And as if you remember what I said, uh, bright areas on diffusion with dark ADC means that there, there are cells there. So there is a residual tumor in here, but the patient had no residual tumor in this area. Interestingly, the uh, interobserver agreement was much higher when we included also the functional MRI. And the last uh, technique I wanted to mention is spectroscopy. With this uh, technique, we study, as I said, the concentration of different molecules uh, within a tissue. It has been widely applied to GBM and other uh, uh, brain tumors, but we can also apply it uh, to tumors, to extracranial tumors. And outside the brain, the two main molecules that we will study are choline and lipids. So choline uh, is within the, the membrane of the cell, so it studies somehow tumor cellularity. And lipids uh, um, studies mostly uh, necrosis, okay? So when uh, the more necrosis we have, the higher concentration of lipids we will ha have uh, within a tissue. MRS or spectroscopy MRI has been uh, used for uh, diagnosis. So in the case of liver lesions, it can help us to define if it's a benign lesion or if it's a, a, a malignant in, and even if it's a, an hepatocarcinoma or a, a metastasis. But it can also help us to, to identify responders to treatment. And this, this group of, um, of patients, they included patients with hepatocarcinomas, uh, large tumors, at least three centimeters, and, and they treat them with chemoembolization. So this is the spectrum of, uh, at baseline, and you can see a peak of choline and relatively low uh, peak of, of lipids. After treatment, the peak of choline disappeared completely, and we have an increase of the, of the peak of, of lipids, and this is quite clear. And again, this has been also applied to the assessment of, of complete response in colorectal uh, cancer after neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So we can see in normal volunteers, we won't have any peak of choline. And after chemoradiotherapy, again, the spectrum switched completely. So uh, we can see the drop of the peak of choline and again, an increase of the lipids. So this is definitely a, a technique that we can use to assess response uh, in our patients as well. And I didn't want to, to uh, leave this room without uh, mentioning something that is hot topic nowadays in radiology, which is uh, um, uh, radiomics. Um, this can be applied to both anatomical and functional sequences, and it's basically to perform a deep or computational analysis of our images. Right now, with we are assessing is the tumor or the image as a whole, but we know that uh, images are formed by uh, thousands of little voxels, and we can analyze which information is behind uh, in, in every single voxel, okay? 
So we can give you a very detailed information about changes in, in shape of the tumor. We can perform deep analysis of the histogram distribution of the different information we get from those voxels. And we can also perform, uh, by applying different mathematical algorithms and matrices, what it's called texture analysis, that I won't get into deep details because it's a bit complex, but basically give us information about the uh, tumor heterogeneity. We are performing right now this kind of studies, uh, so we delineate the area of interest, and we can also include an area around the tumor, so we can uh, study both the tumor and the uh, microenvironment. And these techniques uh, has been also applied by other groups, also in the setting of uh, um, assessment of, of, of response, complete response to uh, chemo uh, radiotherapy, neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy in rectal cancer. So you can uh, see the comparisons of the results from the standard T2, the anatomical MRI sequences, with uh, just diffusion. When we combine both uh, sequences, uh, the sensitivity increases quite a lot. But look, when we uh, develop a radiomic signature of response. The only issue here, and you must take this into account, is that uh, it hasn't been validated into um, other cohorts yet. So there is still a lot of work uh, to do. And these are my, my last uh, slides. Advantages of functional MRI. Uh, I think that they are clear. We can perform whole body assessment. This doesn't make any difference to uh, PET techniques as well. We can assess patients at different uh, time points, definitely, so we can develop uh, response biomarkers. MRI has a very, very high spatial resolution, so we can assess, as I said, the tumor and the microenvironment. An important thing is that we can assess not only intra-patient heterogeneity, but also intra-tumor heterogeneity. Uh, so uh, this is uh, very important in order to help you to study so uh, mechanisms of resistance and tumor evolution. Uh, obviously, these are non-invasive uh, techniques, so that's why sometimes uh, we call them virtual biopsies. And Mm, as uh, Dr. Uh, De Rose uh, said as well about PET, uh, changes in, in molecular and histological features occur much earlier than macroscopic changes, so we can develop much earlier response biomarkers with these kind of techniques. And uh, on the contrary to PET, we don't use ionizing radiation, and many times we don't even need uh, intravenous contrast, so these are very uh, well tolerated um, techniques by patients. But obviously, as any other uh, technique, it has its uh, challenges as well. I had to mention, because uh, this has been an, an issue discussed for a long, long time, standardization, repeatability, although I must tell you that uh, for many of those parameters, we have shown, uh, shown very uh, good correlations and inter- and intra-observer correlations. But something that we have to uh, definitely work um, much more is in the external validation and to include this kind of studies also in clinical trials and prospective uh, cohorts. So uh, just three main uh, messages to take you home. Functional MRI informs on tumor pathology and molecular features. Functional MRI allows uh, to develop uh, predictive and early response biomarkers in cancer patients. So with all these new imaging biomarkers, and here we, I will include my colleague with the uh, PET-CT and PET-MRI, we now need to decide which is the best imaging technique for every patient, for every tumor, and every drug that it's being tested. So we, we are in the area of precision medicine, and we need to include uh, precision imaging to ultimately in, in improve our cancer patient care. So thank you very much for your attention.